Maverick News presents The Rick Walker Show Defrag Your Mind Good evening everyone, friends, and Maverick family, and new viewers, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I don't know if we should even bother talking about anything else after what I heard today from the congressional hearing into UFOs or UAPs or whatever you want to call them. Flabbergasting. Um, I would say unbelievable, but it's not unbelievable. It's very believable. They exist. Let's just call it like it is. At this point, I think it's very hard to deny the existence of unidentified aerial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects or whatever you want to call them. They're out there. Not only are the objects out there, we heard testimony today from someone who is very credible indicating that the U.S. government is in possession of such objects. Not only that, we heard testimony today under oath from credible witnesses, a, 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 a witness who is very credible, who is saying that the U.S. government is also in possession or has been in possession of biological life forms that are non-human, that were aboard these UAPs or UFOs. In other words, he's telling us there are non-human life forms on board these unidentified objects. Not all of them. The vast majority, I guess, are explained away, but there are many that are not. And it appears that the explanation for some of the objects that have never been explained, the actual explanation is that the government has possession of them. This is like X-Files for real folks. Now, I never thought I would be sitting in a chair like this, in front of a camera, broadcasting this to the world in my lifetime. Not that I ever dismissed the idea of UFOs or the possibility of life from other planets as being a, you know, a real possibility. I always, I have always said that we would be pretty smug to sit here and think that we are the only intelligent life form, period. Just look up at the stars and you're looking at an infinite universe. Some are out there. There has to be other life, intelligent life. 
And it's not to say necessarily that the intelligent life forms at the helm of these aerial craft are alien. They might be from right here on Earth. We don't know. We're going to hear some of the uh, the key testimony here tonight. We'll bring you the highlights from today's hearing. We'll also dig into some of the other news of the day, including what happened with Hunter Biden in court today. We'll talk about Justin Trudeau's major cabinet shuffle, a prelude to an election, I suspect, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We will recap his town hall with Sean Hannity and show you why RFK Jr. really outclassed the Fox News host. All that and more coming up right here on the Maverick News Channel. Don't go away. Greetings, brave Mavericks. Our quest for truth continues. We go beyond fake news. Together we expose propaganda. Together we pull others out of rabbit holes. We are maverick thinkers. We are all unique individuals, individuals, defenders of individual rights and freedoms, credible, trusted, grounded in reality. Maverick News, Maverick, maverick News. News. Defending free speech, free speech, free speech. Donate at freedomreporters.com. Do it now. now. Tomorrow. Maybe too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. Maverick News. The, the world, world is, is watching. watching. Okay, let's start with, it has to be the biggest story in the universe. And I mean that literally. A former military intelligence officer turned whistleblower told House lawmakers that Congress is being kept in the dark about unidentified anomalous phenomena or an unidentified aerial, aerial phenomena or unidentified flying objects, whatever. He's alleging or alleged today at a hearing that executive branch agencies have withheld information about these mysterious objects for years. David Grush, who served for 14 years as an intelligence officer in the Air Force and National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, appeared before the House Oversight Committee's National Security Subcommittee alongside two former fighter pilots who had firsthand experience with UAP, or UAPs, plural, Grush served as a representative on two Pentagon task forces investigating UAPs until earlier this year. He told lawmakers that he was informed of a multi-decade UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program during the course of his work examining classified programs. He said he was denied access to those programs when he requested it and accused the military of misappropriating funds to shield those operations from congressional oversight. He also said during his testimony that he had interviewed officials who had direct knowledge of aircraft with non-human, get that, non-human origins, and that so-called biologics were recovered from some of the craft. Bodies. Can you, can you digest that? Can you absorb it? Can you process that? Can you handle the truth? Members of both parties questioned how Congress should go about investigating the remarkable allegations, a reflection of the increasing willingness by lawmakers to demand the executive branch be more forthcoming about the phenomena. We're going to uncover the cover-up, and I hope this is just the beginning of many more hearings and many more people coming forward about this, said Republican Tom Burchett. He's a Republican from Tennessee. 
So the Pentagon has not really responded to a request for comment about Grush's claims, but the department has denied his assertions in the past. The UAP issue has gained widespread attention from Congress and the public in recent years with the release of several video recordings of the encounters, which typically show seemingly nondescript objects moving through the air at very high speeds with no apparent method of propulsion. No exhaust, no heat signature, no wings. And they move like almost instantaneously. The Pentagon's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which Congress established last year to investigate the incidents, has investigated roughly 800 reports of UAP as of May. While military officials have said most cases have innocuous origins, many others remain unexplained. Lawmakers say the military knows more about the objects than it has disclosed to Congress. What the witnesses said at the UAP or UFO hearing, well, what have they said? They said a lot. They said today, Grush, well, first he said that, well, let's go to his opening first, his opening statement, shall we? Okay, here's David Grush. Opening statement. Let's just pick it up. This guy, I wasn't sure what to make of him when he did an interview just, uh, what, about a week or two ago on News Nation. First uh, coming forward with these public allegations. Now he's testifying at this hearing today. And I would say he is much more credible here today in this session than he was in that news interview. Just, I think, because he had more time, was given more latitude to provide actual explanations and provide more details, he came across to me as being extremely credible. Here he is, David Grush, former intelligence officer uh, who had been tasked through most of his career with investigating UFOs. Opening My name is David Charles Grush. I was an intelligence officer for 14 years, in the, both in the U.S. Air Force, uh, both active duty Air National Guard and Reserve, at the rank of major, and most recently from 2021 to 2025, or excuse me, 2023, uh, at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, uh, at the GS-15 civilian level, which is uh, the military equivalent of a full bird colonel. I was my agency's co-lead in unidentified anomalous phenomena and transmedium object analysis, as well as reporting to the UAP task force, UAPTF, uh, and eventually, once it was established, uh, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, ARO. I became a whistleblower through a PPD-19 urgent concern filing in uh, May 2022 uh, with the Intelligence Community Inspector General. Uh, following concerning reports from multiple esteemed and credentialed current and former military and intelligence community individuals that the U.S. government is operating with secrecy above congressional oversight uh, with regards to UAPs. My testimony is based on information I've been given by individuals with a long-standing track record of legitimacy and service to this country many of whom also have shared compelling evidence in the form of photography, official documentation, and classified oral testimony to myself and many co my various colleagues. I have taken every step I can to corroborate this evidence over a period of four years while I was with the UAP task force and do my due diligence on the individual sharing it. Uh, this is because of these steps, I believe strongly uh, in the importance of bringing this information before you. I am driven by a commitment of both uh, to truth and transparency, rooted in our inherent duty to uphold the United States Constitution and protect the American people. I'm asking Congress to hold our government to this standard and thoroughly investigate these claims. But as I stand here under oath now, I am speaking to the facts as I've been told them. 
In the U.S. Air Force, in my National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, Reservist Capacity, I was a member of the UAP Task Force from 2019 to 2021. I served at the NRO Operations Center on the Director's Briefing Staff, which included the coordination of the Presidential Daily Brief and supporting a variety of contingency operations, which I was the Reserve Intelligence Division Chief uh, backup. In 2019, the UAP Task Force Director asked me to identify all special access programs and controlled access programs, also known as SAPs and CAPs, uh, we needed to satisfy our congressionally mandated mission, and we were direct report at the time to the DEPSEC DEF. At the time, due to my extensive executive level intelligence support duties, I was cleared to literally all uh, relevant compartments and in a position of extreme trust, both in my military and civilian capacities. Uh, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program, uh, to which I was denied access to those additional read-ons when I uh, requested it. I made the decision, based on the data I collected, to report this information to my superior, superiors and multiple inspectors general, and in effect becoming a whistleblower. As you know, I've suffered Retaliation for my decision, uh, but I am hopeful that my actions will ultimately lead uh, to a positive outcome of uh, increased transparency. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. So that's David Grush. Now, his, his bombshell today was this where he says the U.S. government has possession not only of, well, he indirectly says that they have possession of these objects or some of these objects and the bodies of whatever life forms were aboard, some of them. Can you believe this? I mean, you better. Better wake up. That the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligence extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you so believe we have them. crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness? Like, how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. So we can't talk about whether they had met with these non-human life forms in an open forum. Can't talk about that. So there's your answer. That means yes. And they have possession of non-human biologics, bodies. Yeah. Under oath. Under oath. And then there's this from a former F-18 pilot who encountered, had a direct encounter with, uh, they call it a tic-tac, it's a UFO. Check this out. This is what happens when you see a flying tic-tac. Sometimes you, I know that some, you have also said some of these answers in the past, but we're trying to get them on the public record as well, which is really important. Mr. Gresh, finally, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? I'm sorry. Uh, this absolutely, is based again. on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and and where? I know the exact locations, and and those locations were provided to the Inspector General 
and some of which to the intelligence committees. I actually had the people with the firsthand knowledge um, provide a protected disclosure to the inspector general. Thank you. And wow. Wow. I mean, like, wow. Under oath. So, as I was saying, um, there were three witnesses today. That's been Grush. All three witnesses, witnesses said current reporting systems are inadequate to investigate UAP encounters and said a stigma still exists for pilots and officials who press for more transparency about their experiences. So we have this uh, Ryan Graves, a former, former Navy pilot. And um, he has spoken about encountering UAP on training missions. There was another guy there too, David Fravor, who spotted a large object captured on the now famous Tic Tac video during a flight off the coast of California in 2004. Graves was an F-18 pilot stationed in Virginia Beach in 2014 when his squadron first began detecting unknown objects. He described them as dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere where the air, where the uh, apex or tips of the cubes were touching the inside of that sphere. He said a fellow pilot told him about one incident about 10 miles off the coast in which an object between five and 15 feet in diameter flew between two F-18s and came within 50 feet of the aircraft. He went on and said there was no acknowledgement of the incident or way to report the encounter at the time. He says that UAP encounters are not rare or isolated. Not rare or isolated. Let me see if I can get you a clip of him. Here we go. Here's Fravor talking about his encounter, his personal experience. Men, cars, men, cars, women. Um, I want to first thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee on the UAP topic that's been in the news for the past six years and seems to be continuing to gain momentum. As you know, my name is David Fravor. I'm a retired commander in the United States Navy. In 2004, I was a commanding officer of Strike Fighter Squadron 41, the world famous Black Aces. We were attached to Carrier Wing 11, stationed on board the USS Nimitz, and had begun a two month workup cycle off the coast of California. On this day, we were scheduled for a 2v2 air-to-air -air training with the USS Princeton as our control. When we launched off Nimitz, my wingman was joining up. We were told that the training was going to be suspended and we were, doing, were going to proceed with real-world tasking. As we proceeded to the west, the air controller was counting down the range to an object that we were going to, and we were unaware of what we were going to see when we arrived. <coughs> there, uh, the controller told us that these objects uh, had been observed for over two weeks, coming down from over 80,000 feet, rapidly descending to 20,000 feet, hanging out for hours, and then going straight back up, for those who don't realize, above 80,000 feet is space. <sighs> we arrived at the location at approximately 20,000 feet, and the controller called merge plot, which means that our radar blip was now in the same resolution cell as the contact. As we looked around, we noticed that we saw some white water off our right side. It's important to note that the weather on this day was as close to the perfect as you could ask for off the coast of San Diego. Clear skies, light winds, calm seas, no white caps from waves. So the white water stood out in a large blue ocean. All four of us, because we were in F-18 F, so we had pilots and Wizzo in the back seat, looked down a small, saw a white tic-tac object with a longitudinal axis pointing north-south and moving very abruptly over the water like a ping pong ball. There were no rotors, no rotor wash, or any sign of visible control surfaces like wings. As we started clockwise towards the object, my Wizzo and I decided to go down and take a closer look at the other aircraft staying in high cover to observe both us and the Tic Tac. We proceeded around the circle about 90 degrees from the start of our descent, and the object, ob object suddenly shifted its longitudinal axis, aligned it with my aircraft, and began to climb. We continued down another 270 degrees, nose low, where the Tic Tac, or we considered 270 degrees, where the, and we went nose low to where the Tic Tac would have been. Our altitude at this point was about 15,000 feet, and the Tic Tac was about 12,000. 
As we pulled nose onto the object within about a half mile of it, it rapidly accelerated in front of us and disappeared. Our wingmen, roughly 8,000 feet above us, lost contact also. We immediately turned back to see where the whitewater was at, and it was gone also. So as you started to turn back towards the east, the controller came up and said, sir, you're not going to believe this, but that thing is at your cat point, roughly 60 miles away in less than a minute. You can calculate the speed. We returned to Nimitz. We were taking off our gear. We were talking to one of my crews that was getting ready to launch. We mentioned it to them, and they went out and luckily got the video that you see, that 90-second video. What you don't see is the radar tape that was never released, and we don't know where it's at, of the active jamming that the object put on an APG-73 radar, and I can get into modes later if you're interested. What is shocking to us is that the incident was never investigated. None of my crew were ever questioned. Tapes were never taken. And after a couple days, it turned into a great story with friends. It wasn't until 2009 until Jay Stratton had contacted me to investigate. Unbeknownst to all, he was part of the ATIP program in the Pentagon led by Lou Elizondo. Uh, and there was an unofficial official report that came out that's now on the internet. Years later, I was contacted by the other pilot, Alex Dietrich, and asked if I'd been contacted. And I said, no, but I'm willing to talk. I was contacted by Mr. Elizondo. And uh, we talked for a short period of time, and he said we'd be uh, in contact. A few weeks after that, I was made aware that Lou had left the Pentagon in protest and joined forces with Tom DeLong, Chris Mellon, Steve Justice, and others to form Two Stars Academy, an organization that pressed the issue with leading industry experts and U.S. government officials. They worked with Leslie Keene, who is present today, Ralph Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper to publish the articles in the New York Times 2017 uh, New York Times. And it removed the stigma on the topic of UFOs, which is why we're here today. Those articles open the door for the government and public that cannot be closed. It has led to an interest from our elected officials who are not focused on little green men, but figuring out where these craft are, where are they from, the technology they possess, how do they operate. It also led to the Whistleblower Protection Act and the NDAA. There are multiple witnesses coming forward to say uh, that have firsthand knowledge, and, and Mr. Grush just covered that. What concerns me is that there's no oversight from our elected officials on anything associated with our government processing or working on craft. Uh, believe not from this world. This issue is not a full public disclosure that could undermine national security, but it is about ensuring that our system of checks and balances works across all work done in the government using taxpayer funds. Relative to government programs, even unacknowledged WAVE programs have some level of oversight by the appropriate committee members in the House and Senate, and this work that is said to be occurring from whistleblower testimonies should not be exempt. In closing, I would like to say that the Tic Tac object we engaged in 2004 was far superior to anything that we had on time, have today, or are looking to develop in the next 10 years. If we, in fact, have programs that possess this technology and needs to have oversight from those people that the citizens of this great country elected in office to represent what is best for the United States and best for the citizens, I thank you for your time. Wow. So what we're talking about here is unidentified flying objects that have the ability to accelerate instantaneously. They defy all known laws of physics. No wings, no propulsion systems that are visible or detectable. They can perform maneuvers that defy the laws of physics, straight up and down, perform hairpin turns mid midair. It accelerate to speeds that are just beyond anything we are capable of. Our, our fastest jets, not even close. They're able to go up into outer space and come straight back down, stay in the atmosphere, fly around, and then go straight back up into the into the sky, into outer space again. We have nothing that can do that. To re-enter from outer space, it creates huge amounts of friction in the atmosphere. All these physical, engineering, scientific problems have been solved by whatever, whomever has created these craft. Concerns today that this represents a serious security threat to the United States, maybe to the world. I guess the good news is we haven't been blown up yet or attacked or have we? What about these claims by some people who um, 
say that they've been abducted. How much of that has been going on, if indeed that's the case? If these objects actually exist, and it appears they do, video evidence, eyewitness testimony. Now, we still don't have, like, here it is, take a look. We don't have that. But these are credible witnesses, two former military people, a senior intelligence official who was given the job of investigating UFOs for years, sitting in front of this hearing under oath, telling us all of this. I say it has to be credible. It has to be real. It has to be the truth. There's too much of it now to, to deny it. These objects moving so fast that we heard during testimony today, no human being could survive inside the craft with the technology that we currently know. One thing comes to mind when Trump was president. I remember, and I wish I could find the clip of him saying this, but he was at a, uh, he was somewhere, I think at an airport, giving a speech. And he just, just touched on the technology that he had seen, but he said he couldn't talk about it. And he said that, to, that the United States had power and technology that was beyond comprehension. That made me think right then and there, and this is several years ago now, where he, he made this statement that uh, it, it made me think that the United States has possession of some sort of Super high tech technology, um, maybe time travel stuff, maybe just uh, transporter type aircraft that just move. I've always thought that, and I'm just sharing thoughts, but I've always thought that in order to solve the problems of long distance space travel, time, grav that the whole key to everything would be something dealing with gravity to warp space and time. And that would explain, you know, magnetism, gravitational forces, warping the space-time continuum that would allow you to suspend objects, make objects appear to fly when they're being pushed or pulled by gravitational forces and accelerate to speeds that are beyond comprehension instantaneously because they are being thrown through space and time or pushed through space and time. But this is just me giving you a little bit of sci-fi speculation. Who knows what we're really dealing with? The idea, though, that or the assertion that the United States is not only in possession of some of these objects, these craft, but also actual biological life forms or the remains of biological life forms that are, quote, non-human. And I don't think they're talking about plants, vegetation, or, you know, dogs. We're talking about non-human life forms. So what would the possibilities be? Well, obviously, potentially, living creatures from another planet, from outside Earth, another world. That would be one possibility. Two some sort of life form that we are not aware of that is intelligent, that has been coexisting with humanity on planet Earth for a long time. That's the other possibility. Maybe under the ocean. Maybe under the Earth. Maybe who knows? 
That would be possibility number two. I would think possibility number three would be, are you ready? Some form of transhuman being. Something may be created by human beings. A transhuman life form. Something that has gone beyond being human. Biologically engineered. By created through some sort of bioengineering or com combining different life forms, combining maybe human beings and non human, um, non biological technology, computer, digital, who knows? But I'm thinking that. In order to survive inside those craft, you need some sort of protective technology for whatever biological life form is inside, encapsulated inside these Tic Tacs or, or spacecraft or aircraft or whatever they are, these flying objects. So you need, you know, maybe a special suit to protect the life form, or maybe you're developing life forms or these life forms are simply capable of withstanding those G forces or other forces that maybe we don't even understand while they're inside these objects flying around at speeds and performing maneuvers that we just simply can't comprehend. So those are the three possibilities that I can think of. Any way you slice it, we need to figure this out. We need to find out what the heck is going on. We also know from today's evidence and testimony that what has been presented today is not complete, that the Pentagon continues to withhold information. They're withholding videos. They are withholding document documents, photographs. They've stated as such. and. That means that there is more evidence out there that the American people, that the citizens of the world are not being allowed to see. The mind blowing thing here too, is that this is not apparently uncommon at all. We heard testimony today that indicates that they are, are there are somewhere in the range, there's somewhere in the range of about 50 of these sightings approximately every single month. Now, is, is that enough to blow your mind? Now, not only is it that common for these things to be reported, we've heard during today's hearing that pilots have now made a, in some, in some, on some air bases, they've made a regular, they've made a part of their routine before they take off to give consideration to possible hazards in the air from these objects. And we heard additional testimony from these experts, at least one of them who, who, who testified today, estimating after interviewing many, many, many people, that um, and and coming into contact with people who have uh, have made these reports, that only about five percent are actually reported, which means ninety five percent go unreported because pilots who see these things are afraid to say anything because they're afraid of, of ruining their reputations. They're afraid of some sort of backlash. They're afraid of the stigma that would stick to them if they came out and said anything about it. Not just military pilots, by the way, but also commercial jet pilots. So we learned today as well that Pilots flying commercial airliners commonly see these objects in the sky. 
So here it is, man. It's 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 a re- it's the real deal. It's it's a real thing. What is it? Unfortunately, today we still didn't actually find out everything. There what there's still not enough evidence, not enough tangible physical evidence before us presented to us today for any kind of conclusive report. We don't know where they come from. We don't know who's behind it, who's involved. But you know what? This has been going on for a long time. We also learned today that reports of these objects recorded by the U.S. government apparently go back as far as the 1930s. The 1930s. And they have been suppressing this information all this time. Why? Why, why, why? What is this big secret? Why can't the people know? Well, it's starting to come out. I think we can can safely say now that UFOs, UAPs, are very, very real. I think we can safely say that. But we don't know where they're from. So we don't know if it's alien technology or some sort of human technology. If it's technology the United States already possesses, if these are actual U.S. military experimental aircraft or something along those lines. Then they've done a really good job of keeping it a big secret. How would they finance it? Well, we also heard testimony today, and this was very interesting. That. The Pentagon and defense contractors seem to just have a really bad track record of accounting for all of the money that goes into their budget. It seems a lot of the money that is earmarked for various defense projects seems to just kind of go wayward. Not really clear where it goes. In fact, in some cases, up to a billion dollars a year. A billion dollars or more. Just poof, gone. Don't know what happened to it. And every time the Pentagon comes before these oversight committees to discuss their budget, we heard today that in terms of, you know, passing grade, they fail miserably every single time. That led to further assertions today that allegations that maybe those missing funds have actually been funneled into these programs to study and even reverse engineer the technology present in these captured or recovered flying objects, which we now know are actually in the possession of the U.S. government. What other country would possibly have this kind of technology? We're told none. So then where are they coming from? Who's responsible? Who's behind all of this? How much? How much of a uh, a risk? How much of an existential threat to these objects represent? I don't know, man. This is... This is crazy, 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 crazy. Let's go back to this clip here from today's testimony. I'll pick this up. All right, check this one out. Here we go. There there uh, has been harmful activity or aggressive activity. Harmful activity. Has any of the activity... um, been aggressive, been um, hostile to, in your reports? Uh, I know of multiple colleagues of mine that got physically injured. And uh, the activity 
And I got to buy buy UAPs or buy by people within the, the federal government. Both. Okay, yeah. so there has been activity by by alien or non non human technology and or beings that has caused harm to humans. Uh, I can't get into the specifics in a, an open environment, but at least the activity that I personally witnessed, and not to be very careful here, because uh, you don't, you know, they tell you never to acknowledge tradecraft, right? So what I personally witnessed myself and my wife was very disturbing. Very disturbing. Worrisome to me now, just a little bit. Like I'm not going to lose sleep tonight because obviously, I guess the good news is these objects have been around for a long time. The entities, the beings, the biological life forms, the people, the wh whoever's behind it, they've been up there flying around for a long time. They must not see us or the military here as any real significant threat. They haven't attacked us yet. Yet. So I guess we shouldn't worry too much, right? I mean, if they didn't attack us yesterday, what would precipitate an attack today or tonight or tomorrow? We're no threat to them. In fact, we are really no threat to them. Asked today, the three witnesses, could you shoot one of these things down? The answer was no, probably not. Probably really hard to do that because you might fire a missile, but they would just accelerate out of the area. They're so fast, you don't stand a chance of hitting one. Now, I don't know what happened with the um, Area 51 Roswell thing. That appears to be some sort of a crash, whether that object was shot down or just through some sort of malfunction. I mean, who knows? We still don't know. There's still just so much we don't know. Why is it all coming out now? Why? Maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just happening because it's happening. Maybe it's just time. I suppose having... The first stories published in major newspapers a number of years ago and having interest in it accumulate and accelerate and snowball over time is sort of forcing this issue and forcing the information out into the sunlight. That I find that in politics and in the operation of government, there's really, you know, nothing, very little that just happens by chance or by circumstance, or by coincidence. So I have to wonder, is there something else going on? What are they, is this prepping us for something? Don't know, I don't know. It's all crazy time though, isn't it? It's like everything is just Wow. You want to see that Tic Tac video? I've got it queued up. Let's take a look at that unidentified flying object. Here it is. Tic Tac. And I'm not, it's not Tic Tac, it's Tic Tac. Just like the little breath mint things, the teeny tiny Tic Tac breath mints. Tic Tacs. Here's the footage. Okay, so you can see something on the, uh, I guess, radar right there. Bam. That splotch. So for those of you just listening on our audio stream, 
We're looking at video of an unidentified flying object through, I believe, fighter jet instrumentation. I'm not a pilot, but you can see that they're picking this thing up on their, on their instrumentation. So this video has been around for quite a while. And this is part of what has led to today's hearing. Look how fast that moved. Look at this. Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Look at that thing, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not I do. an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a other thing, thing, it's rotating. Target? No, I took an auto track. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow. Look at oh, the fly. <laughs> when I started my business. Wow. Like, wow. Can you, can you fathom that? The speed. That's what she looks like. That's what she looked like out there. Isn't that bizarre? Some of this stuff, yeah, like, um, I don't know. So lawmakers from both sides of the aisle expressed anger over their inability to today to access information about UAP, condemning what they called a system of overclassification that shields crucial reports from the public's view, uh, demands for immediate disclosure echoed throughout this hearing today as the national security implications of these unknown objects could not, cannot, will not be ignored. We'll keep you informed on this as more information emerges whenever that happens. Like I said, I don't even know if there's anything else worth talking about tonight. This this is mind-blowing. This blows up our world as we've known it, doesn't it? Everything we thought we knew, everything that maybe made us feel secure and warm and fuzzy inside, our sense of security, safety, obliterated, really. The United States, the most powerful country in the world, well, if those objects are not in the possession of the United States, then all the money we've spent on military hardware in our countries has been probably not for much. It's pretty clear. The United States is not the superior military, technological, scientific force on this planet. Somebody has superior technology, and it does represent an existential threat at this point to the United States, to North America, to the entire world. Think about that. The New World Order. Government Overreach. The Great Reset. Mainstream media lies. Now more than ever, independent voices are needed. Donate now, at freedomreporters.com. That's freedomreporters.com. Maverick News. The antivirus program. For your mind.
All right. Well, from alien weirdness to Hunter Biden weirdness, back to contemporary news, I guess, for lack of a better way to describe. And the idea, I don't know, whatever. You know what I'm getting at. I was going to say back to reality, but that too is reality. And that's not to say that. Oh, let me just put this out of my mind. I can't even wrap my head around some of this stuff right now. It's uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to to take in. Can you handle the truth? Well, on the Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, Biden family front court case, a dramatic scene unfolded today from Delaware federal court as a plea deal struck between prosecutors and Joe Biden's son, the El Presidente's son, Hunter Biden, fell apart amid concerns from the judge over the terms of the agreement. For nearly three hours, U.S. District Judge Mary Ellen Norica uh, meticulously scrutinized every aspect of the plea deal, leading to visible expressions of discontent from both the government's attorneys and defense counsel. Hunter Biden had previously agreed to acknowledge his failure to pay taxes on income received in 2017 and 2018, with prosecutors recommending probation to avoid prison time. Additionally, he would have accepted a pretrial diversion on a separate gun charge with the possibility of the charge being dropped upon compliance with specific terms. Democrats in Washington praised the possible plea as a sign of accountability, while Republicans criticized it as a sweetheart deal. However, the judge, a Trump appointee, expressed concerns during the hearing about linking Hunter Biden's tax plea agreement with the gun charge deal. She also raised questions about a provision in the agreement that could potentially grant Hunter Biden blanket immunity, preventing broader prosecution in the future. After the lengthy hearing, the judge deferred the plea deal, repeatedly expressing her dissatisfaction with its quote, form over substance. She said, I have concerns about the agreement and went on to say, that's why I'm asking these questions, emphasizing her commitment to due diligence. Even if a revised deal is reached between the parties, the judge indicated today doubts about the appropriateness of the probation agreement. In the meantime, Hunter Biden entered a not guilty plea courtroom drama continued with turbulent interludes. The discussion about possible immunity agreements led to tensions between the parties, resulting in prosecutors threatening to bring charges under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Hunter Biden's attorney, Chris Clark, declared the plea agreement null and void, leading to, uh, well, there were gasps, actually, in the courtroom as all this was happening. You could hear them. Multiple recesses followed, during which lawyers engaged in heated negotiations to resolve differences over the immunity deal. Frazzled attorneys on both sides sought solutions, with Clark expressing frustration and concern. As the parties awaited the judge's return, the situation escalated. Hunter Biden, visibly agitated, consulted with his legal team. Well, Weiss, the U.S. attorney, appeared equally uneasy. The dispute seemed to reach an impasse with seasoned defense attorney Abe Lowell stepping in to assess the matter for Hunter Biden. Eventually, the judge requested additional briefing from the parties in the coming weeks before making any final decisions. So toward the end of the hearing, the judge voiced her frustration, expressing her reluctance to merely rubber stamp the deal. In the end, she did not accept the agreement, leaving the fate of Hunter Biden's plea deal uncertain. As a result, the Hunter Biden saga continues. I think he has been under investigation for this stuff now for about five years. What's the saying? Justice delayed is justice denied. Well, who's seeking justice? The American people. 
as I understand it, he owes something like $100,000 for each of those two years in which he did not pay taxes, where he made, I think he reported income. If I read previous reports accurately of over a million and a half dollars in each of those years, that's what he reported. Taxes owing over a hundred grand did not pay. That's actually not that much tax on that much income. When I think about what I've had to pay in income taxes over the years and what you have to pay in income taxes every year. Sweetheart deal. Looks like he's had a sweetheart deal for a long time. What did he do to earn his money? What kind of a sweetheart deal did he get from Burisma over in Ukraine? Well, that's all part of the story, isn't it? Where did Hunter Biden's money come from? Why didn't he pay his taxes? This is unprecedented territory. Came very close today to potentially having some sort of a resolution to this case. I have to say, I find it um, hopeful that this happened. I find hope in it a little bit, just a little bit, that actual justice might end up being done. You know, in some of these charges, Hunter Biden potentially could go to jail for a maximum of 10 years instead of just walking away with a little slap on the wrist, which is look, which looked like that's where it was going today until this plea deal fell apart. Politics is a dirty, dirty, dirty game, isn't it? And we also know from reports over the past few weeks that the Department of Justice appears to have not handled this case in the same way that they would handle such a case for just a regular citizen. We've had people directly involved, whistleblowers come forward and say, testify, reveal information that shows the DOJ. They've been treating this with... Uh, Kid gloves. Sweetheart deal. He's had a special deal for a long time. I'm honestly surprised it's even gotten this far. And while I have this much hope today that actual justice might be done, I have this much skepticism. I don't have much faith. <laughs> I think I think in the end, the special treatment will continue through sentencing and beyond. I'll be back. Hello, world. Are you awake? Uniting humankind by liberating millions of minds at a time. Maverick News. The world is watching. The New World Order. Government overreach. The Great Reset. Mainstream media lies. Now more than ever, independent voices are needed. Donate now at freedomreporters.com. That's freedomreporters.com. Maverick News. The antivirus program for your mind. Okay, so actor Kevin Spacey has been found not guilty in a London court on a series of sexual assault charges, which came from several accusers. Twelve jurors began deliberating about noon Monday after a three-week trial 
Spacey entered a plea of not guilty on 12 charges of sexual assault. The 64-year-old actor has been cleared of nine charges. The additional charges had been struck down before the jury even began its deliberations. Prosecutors had sought during the trial to label Spacey as a sexual bully. He did take to the stand and defended himself. Elton John also appeared as a character witness for the defense, testifying remotely from Monaco about Spacey, who uh, once attended uh, some sort of a big party, a gala at Elton John's Windsor home. Spacey had appeared in a London court in July 2022 and pled not guilty after Metropolitan Police formally charged him. Uh, the Crown Prosecution Service announced five charges against Spacey back in May of 2022, accusing him of sexual assault against three men. There was um, one charge of causing a person to engage in penetrative sexual activity without consent, prosecutors alleged at the time. There were an additional seven charges, which were added later. Um, some months later, in November of 2022, the Academy Award-winning actor has faced allegations and charges of sexual assault, not only in the United Kingdom, but also in the United States. He was found not liable back in October in a civil sexual assault suit, which was uh, brought by actor Anthony Rapp in New York City. And so, yeah, he uh, voluntarily appeared in court in London, took the stand, defended himself, had Elton John come to his defense. Several of the uh, UK allegations back from 2001 and 2013 came from Spacey's tenure as an artistic director. Um, at a London theater company called The Old Vic. The allegations were made public in 2017. They came to the surface two years after Spacey had left that job. Um, and he said at the time that the allegations were a shock and were disturbing. And uh, I've got the cl a clip of Spacey here from today. A reaction to... The verdict. Here we go, Kevin Spacey. I imagine that many of you can understand uh, that there's a lot for me to process after what has just happened today. But I would like to say that I'm enormously grateful to the jury for having taken the time to examine all of the evidence and all of the facts carefully before they reach their decision. And I am humbled by the outcome today. I also want to thank the staff inside this courthouse, the security, and all those who took care of us every single day. My legal team, Evan Lowenstein and Lucy, for being here every day. And um, that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you very much. What do you guys think? Was that the right decision? Did you guys follow his case closely enough to come to any judgment of your own? Were you following the case? Did you see much of the testimony? I didn't see the testimony. I can't, I can't sit here tonight and give you an intelligent assessment of the evidence in any way that would lead me to any kind of a conclusion because I just haven't seen enough of it. What are you guys thinking? Yeah, so Barron says, uh, well, Barron is skeptical, thinks that uh, Kevin Spacey might, might have actually been guilty. What else do we have here in the chats tonight? Barron also says, if Elton John is your character witness, you might want to plea bargain. 
Well, the legal team seemed to do their job. They got an acquittal. Isabel uh, says, Baron, it was the most open use of Masonic connection since yesterday. Uh, what else? Who, anybody else commenting on this tonight? David Murdry says, Elton John's chin gas smashed. Oh, I can't say that on the air. Okay, and people just not buying the outcome. And Sandy says, I love Kevin Spacey. House of Cards was awesome. And I have to say, he's a very talented actor. Uh, one of the most talented actors I, I can think of, actually. His versatility, his, his ability to create characters, very convincing, versatile. Um, here's Jilly Bean. Never me, eh, Rick? I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Well, anyway, hang on a second here. Okay, I'm going to take another quick break and be right back after this. Oh. 